on it, not a PowerPoint, anyhow. I usually print it out. We had a little couple of dramas trying to print it. We couldn't do that. So let's hope this works. Anyhow, praise the Lord. Welcome, everybody. Um, Ryan, yeah. you're standing up. Could you just say uh, a prayer for open the meeting? Okay. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hello. Lord God, we just uh, thank you for today, there, Lord, just to uh, be here all together, to have uh, this unity, to have the truth, there, Lord God, uh, Lord, to be filled with your spirit, to, uh, to know you, there, Lord God, and uh, Lord, just to have this relationship with you, and uh, Lord, just even to be able to love you, Lord, to know you, and uh, and respect you, Lord God, and we, we pray for this meeting, there, Lord, and uh, and what Pastor Jock's going to be sharing with us there, Lord God, that it just uh, helps us to uh, grow in you there, Lord God, that uh, we can be further of use to your kingdom there, Lord, that we can see people, Lord, just to respond to your gospel. We pray these things in your name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Oh, Hallelujah. Oh, okay. Um, just really covering some basic stuff that we all, I guess, so we all know. I just mainly wanted to talk about ideas. So why I'm part of this fellowship, and um, and there is there is a difference. Often people say to us, "Oh, we're just the same as you." Well, in all my uh, years in the Lord, which is coming up uh, just over sixty three years, um, I have not um, not, not until next month sixty three years. Um, I've not yet met. People, no, I'm not saying I never ever have said we're the only ones, this or that. I believe there's mostly millions of people saved in the world. And I'm not talking about salvation as such, but more, the, I believe the uniqueness of our fellowship and why we're part of it. Back in the early days of our fellowship, the two founding fathers, um, Leo Harris and Tom Foster, when they got together, they they started a fellowship on two major doctrines. Uh, one was on Bible prophecy, and the other was on what we call the Pentecostal revival. They were the, and they amalgamated those two beliefs, which is pretty rare that that happens. That those two things happen, and in, within the world, one of the first phrases I heard uh, when I first came along was, "We, we believe in the full gospel." I don't know if there's any other group around other than the world of Pentecost that actually uses that phrase. I never have heard them use it, but it, we're not the only one. But often, particularly back then in the early days of when I came to the Lord, and Pentecost was a lot smaller than what it is now. Um, but there was a term that I heard, which indicates, of course, that other people don't preach the full gospel. Otherwise, you wouldn't have that term. We believe in the full gospel. And... Um, but actually, in the very early magazines back in those 40s and 50s era, they added an extra word to that, and they often would talk about the full kingdom gospel. And you'll see it in the very early magazine, particularly one called Echoes of Grace. And uh, again, combining what they mean by that is that they've got the prophecy with the salvation message. Um, we'll look at a few scriptures, although I think we pretty well know them all. Let's go to, uh, I'll just quote Revelation 14, verse 6, as we turn to dear old Mark 16. Mark 16, verse 15, of course. But the one I'm going to quote just from Book of Revelation, it says in chapter 14, verse 6, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. So, we do really believe in the gospel, the full gospel, and we do believe it's unchangeable and it's everlasting. Well, the first scripture that I was ever shown, it was funny, you know, all the time I was in the Anglican church, I don't actually remember anybody ever quoting the Bible to me. Even when I belonged to a Billy Graham crusade, um, sort of Baptist level, it was only ever I would quote a couple of scriptures and then mainly preach even though Billy Graham is a very good preacher, there's still only a few scriptures. And then when I went to the Baptist church, again, it was mainly just using the Bible as sort of a, a little bit of a reference to talk about whatever they wanted to talk about. But when I met the person who witnessed to us, the first thing he did was get the Bible out and said, look, 
I want you to read what the Bible says. Now, that had never happened in my religious experience up until that point. And the scripture that he chose was this one in Mark 16. As I said, we know it um, by the back of our hand, but let's just read it again. By the way, there's always been a debate whether Mark 16, verse 9 to 20, was actually in the original. It obviously was in the original there somewhere because it really is been fulfilled within the Bible. When you read all the signs following, all of them were fulfilled. So go into all the world, verse 15, and preach the gospel to every creature. That was the first verse I had ever read indicated by a spiritual person. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And I realized then how blunt and how exact the Bible is. It's only people that change it. Believe and baptize, you're saved. If you don't believe, you're damned. I really like that, the bluntness of it. Then these wonderful signs shall follow them in, 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 that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up sermons, if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So we could dwell on all of those. This way, the one that really stood out at that time was the speaking in tongues at the end of verse 17. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And verse 20, of course, really had an impact on me. And they went forth. By the way, that was after Pentecost, not at this particular moment. After Pentecost, they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. It was also, I didn't understand it at the time. When, I, when the day that I first read it, when I was, still just a schoolboy, 17 years old. All that I, the moment I finished reading it, all I knew was I don't really know what that means. All I know is whatever it says, I haven't got it. And I instantly knew for some reason I wasn't saved. Even though I'd given my heart to Jesus and been told that I was saved in the Baptist church, never got baptized there because it didn't really mean much to them. It was just like a church ceremony and, and so on. So as I said, um, so when I first came along, like every or most people like me, didn't really know anything. And then I started to grab bits over the next few months and weeks, particularly after I came to the Lord. It took a few months, by the way, before we actually, my family did anything. And you sort of grab another bit and think, wow, that's exciting. We believe that. And then what about this and what about that? You start to uh, add to the initial knowledge. Um, just click here. And just the other one, of course, without we won't read them all tonight. Just close that, John. Uh, is, is John 3. That was the next exciting discovery. Um, in John 3, by the way, just starting to read there in verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. No man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, very or truly, truly, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said, How can this? How can, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And again, when this was presented to me within our fellowship, it was very much, look, you've got to do this. You'll get nowhere, and you've got to be baptized. You've got to repent. You've got to get baptized. You've got to fill with the Holy Spirit. Or, in other words, you've got to be born again or born from above. You won't go anywhere until that happens. So none of this give your heart to Jesus. None of this say the sinner's prayer and all the other stuff that have been presented to me, which, as you know, is not in the Word of God. So you've got to do this. And it's interesting how Nicodemus thought that he could have a religious discussion with Jesus, sort of one on one, or even maybe could have even been a bit condescending. You know, I'm a very important Pharisee, and you mostly should be really tickled pink that I reckon you're all right. I reckon you're a man of God. And Jesus came back and said, we have no conversation until you're born again. We're not on the same playing field. We're not singing from the same hymn sheet. And as you go through, you find that Nicodemus more and more didn't understand what Jesus was saying. And Jesus went back again and said, you must be born again. And um, just down towards the end, where we just see there, uh, I'll go to verse uh, 8. And just where that, we know that there is another thought on this, on that it 
could have possibly been referring to speaking in tongues. I just say I still quite like the old way that I looked at it when I came to the Lord because I think that's got a message in it as well. So I'll read it how I understood it back then, 63 years ago. And verse 8, the wind bloweth where it listeth, and they heareth the sound thereof, but they canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that was born of the Spirit. And I dare say with the, the old way that we used to possibly present it both ways is that somebody filled with the Holy Spirit, you can see the impact upon them. Like you see a branch of a tree waving in the wind. You can't see the wind unless you live in downtown London or somewhere where it's pretty polluted. Not anymore, it isn't. Um, you can't see the wind, but you can see the effect of it. And the, the thought at the time was anybody that's born of the Spirit, you can't actually see the Spirit, but you can see the effect of it in their life. So as I said, that was sort of quite early on that came to a very excited to discover this. Um, and we'll go a little bit further. And... Um, um, just quickly go to Acts chapter 18 again. We'll jump over Acts 2 at this point to where they received the Holy Spirit. But I really uh, was excited about the way it came to the church at Ephesus. So in Acts chapter 18, we have the conversion of this great apostle. I think the Bible calls him an apostle in one spot called Apollos. So in Acts chapter 18, verse 24, a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria. By the way, a Jew born in Alexandria usually meant a highly educated Jew. That's where the seat of learning was at that particular time in the Jewish world, maybe more than it was in Jerusalem. And the great scholars and so on, The uh, when the Bible was translated about 300 years before this time from Hebrew into Greek, it was done in Alexandria. So it was sort of a Jewish stronghold. So the fact that it says he was born there, he mostly always was part of a well-known great thinkers and teachers of the Jewish religion. It says he was an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, which goes with what I just said. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord. So he's beyond just being a Jew and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord. And this is knowing only the baptism of John. I particularly related to this because being a Baptist at the time, there was a limit to the knowledge that I'd received at that point. And uh, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. And then this husband and wife team for the Lord, Aquila and Priscilla, they heard him talk. They took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. He is an exceptional man because usually when you grab a guy like Apollos, an eloquent man, and might, they're very hard to convert. They know it all. And, you you know, they're a great, well-known preacher. And who's this couple trying to tell me I don't know what I'm talking about? It's usually the reaction when you get somebody like But he wasn't like that. He was very humble. And he accepted what they said because he loved the scriptures, I dare say. And then he began to speak boldly in the synagogue and read all that. Verse 27, and when he had disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who when he came helped them much, which, which had believed through grace. So uh, he had only just come to the Lord because of all that basic knowledge he had, though, which he could easily bring into the church. Obviously, he was a great blessing to the church. In verse 28, and he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. So I'm sure later on he got involved in praying for people and miracles. But right now, maybe like myself, I never saw a miracle. The first one I saw was when I received the Holy Spirit, even though I believed in it all. But um I was convinced by the scriptures. That was they showed me Mark 16 and John 3 and Acts 2. And so I became convinced by the scripture, maybe like he did, that uh, not that Jesus was the Christ, but this was the truth. Then in chapter 19, verse 1, and it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, I believe, and it can't prove any of this, but the, the fact that it mentions Apollos, that this little story here is connected to Apollos. Uh, because these disciples also only believed in the teaching of John the Baptist. 
So while Apollos was at Corinth, I would say converts of Apollos. I'm just guessing that. Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. So he wasn't there when Apollos got converted, even though he was a, a contemporary with uh, Aquila and Priscilla. But he turns up there and he finds these disciples. A lot of people say, oh, they must have been Christians. They're called disciples. No, you can be a disciple of anything. You can be a disciple of Nazism or fascism. You can be a disciple of any belief. It doesn't mean you're a Christian. They were disciples of John the Baptist. And he said unto them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? So all we know is that he got into conversation with them and they were chatting away happily about loving God and all that sort of thing. And they obviously mentioned that they were baptized because that comes up straight away. So they talked about that they were baptized. But the one thing that Paul picked up on, they didn't talk about the Holy Ghost. They didn't talk about speaking in tongues. So he then said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe what you're telling me? They said, we don't know or haven't heard where there be any Holy Ghost. So they said, we don't know what you're talking about. So then he picked up, he said, something wrong here. You say you got baptized and you didn't get the mention of the Holy Ghost. That, 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 can't, that doesn't happen. When you get baptized in the Lord, the Holy Ghost is very much mentioned, even in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, or that you can be filled with the Holy Spirit. So, so he said, there's something wrong here. Oops, something wrong, all right. What have I done here? Clicking while I'm talking. And they said, we don't know. And then he said unto them, well, then unto what were you baptized? There's something wrong here. And they said, under John's baptism. Oh, then Paul sort of said, okay. So we're going right back to then. Even though John the Baptist certainly believed in the Holy Ghost and was anointed of the Holy Spirit and all the things that happened, he wasn't part of the church because he was already dead and buried by that time. So he then explained, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him, which would come after. He was the person, of course, the voice in the wilderness saying, that's Jesus Christ. That was his job. He came to be the earthly witness that Jesus was the Christ. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So he said, we want to get this right. And they got baptized this time not in the name of John the Baptist or whatever words were said, but in the name of Jesus Christ. When Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about 12. So this is the beginning of the Ephesian church. I just like the order of this happened, the way Paul did it. There's something wrong here. You talk about baptism, but you don't talk about the Holy Ghost. You don't even know about the Holy Ghost. There's something really wrong here. Oh, you're John, as far as John the Baptist goes, Right, now that explains, I'll take you on from John the Baptist to Jesus Christ, and they got baptized again. So again, all of that was early stuff for me in, the, in my walk in the Lord, that that came to me as a, a great blessing. Okay, now I'm going to jump subject. I'm going to talk about another great part of the fellowship, which I have already mentioned, and that is the prophecy in our fellowship. And that was something I learned about, again, within two or three weeks of coming to the Lord. Didn't know anything about prophecy. Never even heard anything about prophecy. The other churches don't talk about it. They might mention the second coming, or a lot of them all weird through the rapture and all that, but nobody really preaches it. Um, I'm just thinking, you know, that we're living in, we know, in very dangerous times. And one of the things that we often talk about is what's called the signs of the time. Is one a covering thing of our situation and the world that we happen to live in? And I remember, or a lot of you will know a great quote from uh, um, what time was Pastor Scott? What time will I head for? What's a good time? What do you time you normally finish? Five ish? Okay, you can handle it till five? Okay, 25 minutes. Okay, so great saying by Winston Churchill after they won the Battle of Britain and they'd survived the Battle of Britain and didn't look like the Germans were going to invade England. He said, now this is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning, one of his great sayings. But I've gone and just said, are we approaching the end of the end? Are we at the last of the last days uh, in that sort of context? 
you know, just grabbing your, you don't need to turn to, turn to Luke chapter 21 while I quote a scripture, and one from the Old Testament, taken completely out of context, but just it says basically what we're situated in. It was the prophecy of Daniel 70 weeks and the uh, time uh, that Jesus would come 490 years later. But it, one of the part of the prophecy in verse 25, it says when it's prophesying about the uh, rebuilding of the walls of, Jer of Jerusalem under Nehemiah, and it says the streets shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And I was thinking of, in a sense, the building again at that time was literal. But in these last days, maybe the last hundred plus years, the church has been re-established on planet Earth. It all pretty well died out. Water baptism was a mess a few hundred years ago. Christening was the only thing around. People didn't receive the Holy Spirit unless maybe on their own somewhere. No, nobody preached it. Even people like Charles Finney, who received the Holy Spirit right back in 1821 uh, AD, even though he received, he never preached it. They always thought it was something special for them. So it wasn't until what we call the uh, Azusa Street Revival under a guy called uh, um, Fox uh, Charles Fox Panham, Param, I'll get it right in a minute, when it all came again. So it's almost like we're building the church again and building up until the second coming, even in troublous times. We live in troublous times and are building again the things of the Lord. But in Luke 21, of course, which was another thing that, as I said, was exciting when I first came along, was talk about the signs of the times. And just grab a couple of verses here. Verse in verse um, 24, uh, 22, sorry, uh, Luke 21, verse 22, for these be the days of vengeance uh, and um, uh, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. So, again, that sort of thought was, hey, we're living in this. It was actually there talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, a little, again, a little bit out of context on talking about the second coming, although that's in this chapter. I'll look up the word vengeance. And it means these are the days of the meeting out of justice, is, is what it says. Done it again. I'm a naughty boy here. Take your hand off it, Joe. Um, what have I done? That was clever of me. I can go back, can I? Where do you go back? Oh, there it is. Go back. Go back. Okay. Leave that alone. Okay, 25. Uh, down in verse 25. And there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, meaning there's no answer, there's no way out. The sea and the waves roaring. Troublesome times. The, the sea and the waves roaring means political upheaval and all the things that are going to be happening at the end. And then it says in verse 26, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. So it really does describe, next verse it goes on to talk about literally the second coming. I'm not going there right now. So um, I remember hearing that, well, I reckon within a fortnight of me coming to the Lord. And the, what I loved every time I heard something, I said, it all added up. And yet, you know, in the Baptist church and even later on in many Pentecostal churches, they didn't seem to talk about this so much, a little bit, not not as much. But, uh, and of course, when I came to the Lord in 1960, they were exploding atom bombs above ground, just down the road from where I lived in Maralinga, near Sajuna in South Australia, was one of the places they detonated atomic weapons. So every now and again, you, you have a picture in the paper of a mushroom cloud. And it went on for quite a few years before they eventually stopped doing that off the coast of Western Australia, one of the islands there, and then later on in the Pacific Islands, they were still exploding these massive atom bombs. So it was very much on your mind at the time. And a lot of people fearful that, uh, you know, we're going to be in a nuclear war. I think right now, of course, it's even far worse, but because we don't see the mushroom cloud so much, it doesn't have that same effect. It's sort of you know, what I mean by much worse, the weapons they've got now and the stockpile they've got is far worse than back then. So uh, it's still there. So Matthew 24, same sort of chapter, um, 
Matthew 24. The other one, of course, we used to hear a lot about and may hopefully still do, is in verse Matthew 24, verse 6 says, you shall hear of wars and rumours of wars. So there's actually two different points it's making here, of actual wars that are happening and there's rumours of wars. And that sort of really does go on. You know, it was a, I don't know who coined the phrase, but it, it became laughable later on when after the horrors of the millions of people that died in the First World War, somebody phrased, made the phrase, whatever it is, of a war to end all wars. Ha, ha, ha. 21 years later, it all broke out again into a world war. And I'm sure there were plenty in, in that 20 years. So the war to end all wars will be when the Lord comes back and not before then. So there's wars, like right now we have a major war going on between Russia and Ukraine, and I'm sure there's mostly rumours of war. Like the Middle East, there's always rumours of war there. I mean, I think just recently Israel and and uh, the Arabs were back at it again and, and killing each other and so on. So it's, that's the world that we live in, the troublesome time, and use the word trouble here. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. That's 2,000 years ago. He said the end is not yet. But maybe we're starting to say we're getting close to the end of the end or the, the last of the last days. Um, and then, of course, um, uh, I, ju I just put down one little bit of fact here on famines. So and there should be famines. And I thought, oh, oh, is there any famine? There bound to be, as we had some horrendous ones over the years since I've been in the Lord. But one I just found out today was the Horn of Africa, a well-known part of the north, north uh, eastern corner of Africa. The Horn of Africa is experiencing its longest drought in 40 years, compounded by high food prices and political instability. This has led to 36.4 million people suffering from hunger across the region and 21.7 million requiring food assistance. So the old famines, the pestilences, we're going to talk about them in a minute, they're, they're still there, and they're as bad as they ever were. We just don't hear so much about them. So, of course, when we have pestilences, I think you know, for many years we would sort of brush over that a bit as though maybe that was talking about some little local thing. Now we can just put one word after that, it's covid you talk about a pestilence, a worldwide, now it's, the screen's dropped out, stop that. Um, a worldwide pestilence, COVID, and I'm sure there's going to be more. Then, of course, the last one on that list, very topical right now, is earthquakes. And we are having or have had one of the, obviously, is it the worst number death-wise, or has there been others worse? We're up around 20 million, isn't that right? 20,000. 20,000, and there's been worse, obviously. I never looked that up. But there we are, Turkey and Syria at the moment. People have died there. And next verse, next, the next verse says, all these are the beginning of sorrows. So let's go again. One of the passages that really I heard quite early on, let's turn to it, Second Timothy in chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Why am I going through all this? Because I honestly think if you go anywhere else, that's just a broad statement. There'd be, praise the Lord, there'd be exceptions to what I say. There definitely would be exceptions. People don't seem to talk about this so much. It's almost like they don't want to face up to it. But here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, and know this also in the last days, perilous, the word perilous means hard to do, hard to bear, troublesome, dangerous, harsh, fierce, savage. In these savage days, I quite like that. Or times, this is what will happen. And it goes through this great list. Men lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient. It's funny, I'm sure you might have had the same reaction. As I read through this 60-odd years ago, you immediately think of things that were happening all around you and in the world, people you were witnessing to, and maybe the, the life you'd just come out of. Um, unthankful, unholy, 
without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that were good. He found that out very quickly when he became a Christian. It wasn't popular. I know in my particular case, I was very fortunate. The mum and dad and my two brothers, we all came to the Lord, but all the rest of the rallies never came. And they were horrified at what we were done. I had an auntie, my mother's sister, uh, and she was, now she wasn't just Anglican, she was High Church of England, which is sort of more almost to the Catholic Church. And in Adelaide, we have a low Church of England, they don't use that word, but maybe what you'd call Protestant Church of England. And they, they have a church on, on North Terrace, Adelaide, called Holy Trinity. And that's a sort of a basic Church of England, like I was brought up in. But the cathedral in Adelaide, the one you see from the Adelaide Oval, if you ever watch footy or cricket, the big cathedral behind the Adelaide's main cathedral is High Church of England, which is almost more Catholic than the Catholics. And um, so um, they were horrified, even bad enough when we went to the Baptist church. But when we talked about speaking in tongues, I'll do a little aside. Uh, when I'd been in the Lord 20 years and we sort of lost contact, unfortunately, with them, I, I had a business, and one of my, my business name at the time was Jock Duncan and Associates. I never had any. Helen always says she was the associate, but it actually means another land. I was a conveyancer, another land broker, we called it back then. Uh, it sounded good, though, Jock Duncan and Associates. And she wrote me a letter 20 years after we'd broken, and she said, are you Jock Duncan, my nephew? And I went back and said, yes, and could 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 I go and see her, which I did. And we chatted away for a while, and it was all quite good until um, she asked about my mother, who was pretty fiery for the Lord. And she said, oh, how's your mother? Blunt like that. And I said, mum's okay. And so on. I'd like to see her. I said, yeah, no worries. And then I mucked it up. I warned her, and I just said, of course, you realise that mum is still very much involved in our family. Right, I don't want to see her. And unfortunately, they never, ever saw each other again. So there was that reaction. Um, and maybe verse 5 does apply. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. And that had a big imp impact on me when I first came to the Lord. Where if there was any doubt of uh, comparing it with Billy Graham, where there's no miracles, believe it or not. He might be a great preacher, but he doesn't believe in miracles, not today. And the Baptist church was as dead as a day and Anglican Church, even worse, if I may say so. And then uh, when you witness them, my best friend at school was a Lutheran, tried to witness to him, no, no, miracles don't happen. Speaking tongues of the devil back in those days, in their opinion. And then it just says simply there, just turn away and basically get on with your walk in the Lord. And as it says in verse 7, ever learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth, you won't find God at university. You won't find God at high school. You mostly won't even find God in kindergarten because everywhere and people that run these places no longer believe in that sort of thing. So keep going. Nearly there. No, I'm not miles to go yet. The other one that was I mentioned the, how our fellowship started was that uh, Tom Foster was in the idea, so the brand name is BI. By the way, I'll say straight here and now, straight here and now. BI has a lot of extremes, which we don't accept. A lot of basic stuff that becomes racist and all. We don't accept any of that. But we do acknowledge the basic thought of the children of Israel, particularly the 10 tribes, immigrating across Europe and settling in Great Britain and all to do with that. We believe that basic belief and maybe try to push aside some of the extremes. Um, Let's go to First Peter chapter 1, because prophecy is a big thing in our fellowship. And I know now and again, because maybe people have heard what I believe is the extremes of that belief, they tend to, bit the old saying, throw the baby out with the bathwater, reject the whole thing. Maybe don't ever stop to think ahead. If you don't have that, then what do you have in its place? And mainly the prophecy of, of most of Christianity is what's called futuristic. It's all imaginary and the rise of the, the Antichrist and, and all the story, totally fabricated from the imagination, that is what people will get onto. So if you don't have a concrete belief of what we believe and how we believe it's historic and how that all the things that God promised he's fulfilled and is fulfilling and will fulfill, because it leaves a vacuum. So it's better to go into it and really, as you're saying, 
uh, spit out the pips and keep the, the main bit of the orange. So First Peter chapter 1, and just in verse 17, it says, For we have, for, for he received from God the Father honor and glory, just talking about Jesus, when there came a voice from heaven, um, a voice to him from the excellent glory, and God said, we know that, he said it twice, when Jesus got baptized, and also on the mount, which is referring to here, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now you would think there would be nothing more wonderful or more convincing than if that voice, I don't mind if God does it right now, but if he did do it right now, you would think that would have to be the biggest proof I ever need. But it doesn't say that here. It goes on then to say, can compared with that, we have a more sure word of prophecy. So it's almost like we've got something better. We've got this thing where God prophesies and we look at the prophecy and we find the fulfillment of that prophecy is a more reassuring thing and a more convincing thing. Um, I looked up a couple of translations there on that. A dear old Wycliffe who translated the Bible into ancient English right back in the 1300s, on this word prophecy, he called it, on this little phrase, should I say, on a more sure word of prophecy, um, he's got a firmer word of prophecy, a firmer word, something firm to stand upon. Uh, Where unto you do well that you take heed, as under a light that shineth in a dark place, under the day dawn and the day star rise in your heart, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scriptures of any private interpretation. That's not so much talking about us interpreting, interpreting, it's talking about the people, person who wrote it. It wasn't their idea. When they gave the prophecy, it was from God, not from them. And then he goes to explain that in verse 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So prophecy is a big thing and has always been a big part of our fellowship. Um. Jump back to a little bit. I thought I wanted to grab as a bit of an example. Genesis 48. Seven minutes, counting. Genesis 48. And this is the great story of Ephraim and Manasseh because I think this is a big part of, 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 of prophecy. Just got a saying here. Where have I got that? I've got it on the next page, but I'll quote it now. Uh, one of the founding fathers, which I've all already mentioned, Leo Harris, said once, I've read it in one of the early magazines, if one cannot distinguish and discern where the nations and kingdoms that make up the people that were known as the 12 tribes of Israel, particularly the, the 10 tribes, if you cannot distinguish and discern where they are on our planet today, you will never get prophecy correct. You'll never get it correct. If you think that the only people that represent the 10 tribes are the Jews, you've only got two of the tribes. And the vast majority of Christendom, Pentecost as well, only ever talk about the two tribes. So they will often get it all wrong. So even uh, say a soft word for Russia and, and America becomes big Satan. They get it all around the wrong way. So you'll never work out Bible prophecy unless you know where the, where the 10 and 12 tribes are on the earth. So I go back to the previous page. Just reading this uh, scripture here in Genesis 48 on the story of Ephraim and Manasseh. And we'll jump to verse 14. And Israel stretched out his hand, or Jacob, the man Jacob, called Israel here, and laid it upon Ephraim. One of the great stories here, Ephraim said, who was the younger? And his left hand upon Manasseh's head guiding his hand wittingly or knowing what he was doing, for Manasseh was the firstborn. So the right hand was always the hand of major blessing, and the lesser hand, the lesser one. So Joseph lined them up. Manasseh, who was the older brother, in front of uh, Jacob, his father, his right hand, left hand there, and Jacob crossed his hand of the Lord. So the right hand went on the younger brother called Ephraim. And... Um, uh, and, and in verse 15, and he blessed Joseph, in a sense, um, Ephraim, because of what he'd done, and said, God before whom my father Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed 
me all my life long unto this day, the angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads, and let my name be on them, and the name of my father Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. A lot of people often refer to the promise, and it's a great one, of the seed of Abraham only being Christianity through Jesus Christ. And this, I don't want to argue too much against that because we think that's a fantastic fulfillment. But Jesus was not a descendant of either of these two tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh. He was a descendant of the tribe of Judah. So this must still apply somewhere. This is nothing, not fulfilled in Christianity, not talking about Christianity. It's talking about nations and the rise of them. He said, um, and, grow, and at the end of that, it says, I've grown to a multitude in the midst of this. So somewhere on the earth today, there should be a people that you can describe as a multitude of nations. And when Joseph saw that his father had laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him, and he held up his father's hand, he's an old man at the time, uh, to remove it from Ephraim's head, under Manasseh's head. And Joseph said unto his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. Um, it's interesting here that it was already too late. Once he had blessed Ephraim, it could not be altered. It was already too late, Joseph. You're wasting your time. Once the words have been said, you can't alter it. But anyhow, his father refused. So he struggled against his son trying to move his hand and said, I know it, my son. I know it. I know what I'm doing. He also should become a people. He also should be great. But truly his younger brother should be greater than he. And his seed should become a multitude of nations. So... Oh, I'll finish, I'll read verse 20. And he blessed them that day, saying, In thee shall Israel, in thee shall Israel bless, saying, or Jacob, God make thee as Ephraim and Manasseh, and he set Ephraim before, before Manasseh. Now, whenever there's a story of this much detail in the Bible, it's got to have a fulfillment. It's got to be important. So as I said, you've got to look there somewhere and say, Well, what did he mean with the, the Manasseh was going to become a great nation? And without going into all the detail, we connect that to the USA. And then the other of the multitude of nations, there's no, no other people on earth that fit anywhere near Britain and the Commonwealth. So again, i just excited about the thought of prophecy. And one thing I'll say to you on prophecy, if you ever get into it, it makes the Old Testament come alive. I even hear people say, oh, I only read the New Testament. Don't forget half the New Testament is quoted from the Old Testament. But just the same, it's an exciting path to go down to see all, like we just read, these great prophecies and know that God has fulfilled them all. Okay. So I pretty well run out of time, and I think I've said enough anyhow. Um, oh, while, we, while you're there, though, in, in Genesis, just go to the next chapter. Another big exciting thing. I found was what we call the throne of David. And Genesis 49 and verse 8, we see the prophecy, we talked about the tribe of Judah. And here it says, Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies, thy father's children shall bow down before thee, meaning they would be royal. When people bow down to somebody, it's a form of royalty. Judah is a lion's whelp, and from the prey my son that gone up, he stooped, he couched as a, as a lion, and as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come. Now Shiloh is a reference to Jesus Christ. He has not yet come, so that should continue until Jesus comes again, and under him shall the gathering of the people. Look, I had a bit more there. I think I've covered enough in one night. Maybe just the final comment on the throne of David. We again, there's a lot of study there, a lot of scriptures, and again and again the Lord said to David, and your throne shall last forever. It's an eternal throne. It's an eternal covenant I've got with you. I, I, I haven't lied to David. He said, if there's a moon and a sun and the stars, while they're there, I'll keep my promise to David. It can never be broken. A lot of scriptures like that. So um, right now, in a couple of months' time, on the 6th of May, um, Charles III is going to be crowned on what's known as the Stone of Destiny, the Stone of Schoon, all the other names. We have a great biblical connection there where the legend, and I only say that, the legend 
is that that stone was the pillow, pillow, must have been a horrible pillow, that Jacob lay his head on and had the angels ascending and descending on the staircase to heaven. So it's interesting at the moment in the light of people saying that belongs to the Scottish people. And I noticed recently even the historians in Scotland are trying to convince everybody that the stone was quarried in Scotland. And if it was, it loses all its value. Because like when James I stole it back in 1296, he already had a stone. He had a stone that nine kings have been crowned next to in, in Kingston in London. You can go and have a look. It's out in the open. Not very valuable. You could, with a bit of effort, you could easily pinch it. That's how much value they put on it. Put on it. You can go up and have a look at it. He went to uh, Schoon Palace and he stole the other one and brought it to London because of the legend if you take the legend away from it, it's just a bit of old sandstone. So that's what makes it so incredibly valuable. So in a few weeks' time, hopefully, the Scots are going to release it and it's going to go down to Westminster Abbey again and be placed in the, the Edwardian chair and uh, and Charles is going to sit on it, on a bit board just above it, and I don't think he would do it if he, he wouldn't go through the coronation or being crowned. And uh, he's going to be crowned Charles III if the Lord hasn't come back by then. So uh, all of that connects with the Bible. It's very exciting. And I think I'm done. And all the people said, amen. Handing back to Peter, am I? Who am I handing back to? Looks like it. No, he's walking out. Oh, no, he's coming. 